back, y'all. It is another episode of the Super Real Estate Bros Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandon Snyder, team leader of selling with the Snyder Group, brokered by EXP in the greater Houston area. Wow, that's a lot to say. And this is Dave, your mortgage guy. Dot com. Oh my gosh, we did it in sync. Today, we're talking about something that uh, we have been wanting to talk about for a minute. We've been seeing a lot of news reports and articles about it, so we're just going to get down and dirty with Houston. We're going to talk about Houston, the most affordable city in the state of Texas. I think the right. title of this podcast should be Houston, the affordable city, right? Houston, the affordable city. I think it's, you know, obviously, like, when you go into, like, the, like, West Texas towns, obviously, they're kind of more affordable because they're smaller towns. But when we're talking about metros... We're talking about big cities. <clears throat> Houston, without a doubt, has to be. Purely yeah. based on sales price and payments and, and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. And even with the past two and a half years of the pandemic absolutely skyrocketing home values and things like that, we're still noticing that uh, we're still pretty affordable and a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, quite a few factors, but one of the main points being the multifaceted uh, economics that surround Houston. Um, when we're talking about the businesses and yep. the uh, industries that are here, we're talking about, we're, it's not like we're bringing in a hospitality industry that's like a cruise line, it's the cheap cruise line that you go to. It's like when you come to Houston and you come and work for uh, the entertainment industry or the medical field out here, you're coming to work for some of the bigger names, the bigger brands, and there's more money to be made. Yeah, super strong financially. <clears throat> think about this too. Houston can continue to build out. I think that's the thing that sometimes people forget is when I first moved here in, I don't know, 02, it pretty much seemed like the end of the world stopped at Sugarland in the, in the <laughs> Southwest. And then Sugarland became Richmond, then Richmond became Rosenberg, and right. then there's a town after Rosenberg, I'm sure, and then that's in the, you know, so I think Houston, not only super strong financially, can continue to grow out, which means home buying is still going to be an option for people right? as the city grows versus every other city, as it grew, they're not able to build anymore. Right. right. So today we're actually going to talk about a few different things, um, but one of the things that I wanted to bring up today... Um, was really important from the pandemic was the number of people that came to Houston to travel here and what that entailed um, Airbnb wise short term rental wise right if you uh, are familiar with the short term rental market there's a lot of investors that own short term rentals in Houston rent them out to people like traveling nurses and there's parties in town and and people come to it's a destination that people want to come Galveston, to Galveston we've got Galveston we've we got don't talk about Galveston sorry no Gal okay, look, I'm from California. Going to Galveston. Sorry, Galveston. No one said this was like California. Galvestonites or whatever you're called these days. Um, look, I go to Galveston for one thing when I get on a cruise ship. That's it, okay? If you haven't been there, there's a beach, which means there's sand and water. It's that's great! It's great water! That's, that's all I'm saying. This no. guy's like all high and mighty with it. Somebody in DFW is like, we don't even have a like, be lucky, be grateful. Exactly. <laughs> and that was my point. No, so... We have so much, uh, so many people traveling here and so much industry happening here. You know, we, I kind of touched on it a little bit. Medical industry is huge here. We have the number one cancer center in the country here, right? MD Anderson. MD Anderson. Uh, they're like slogan things says, uh, like they, they like cross out the cancer and they're like, we don't deal with cancer here or something like that. I'm like, that's great. But it's actually one of the best in the country. Um, we have an incredible, absolutely incredible uh, nightlife, entertainment industry, arts district. So what does this mean housewise? So you're probably listening to this and you're like, I don't care that the museum has a dinosaur skeleton. What does that mean for me? And if I was going to buy a house or sell a house in Houston? So let's let's dive into that. Part of it's income, right? I mean, that's a what, huge part. Yeah, 100%. And I've seen an art, articles and I've actually talked about one where, and you're starting to see a narrative here where something's not affordable mm -hmm. and it's almost like they're putting a stigma on that person and saying you can't afford so the article was like saying if you make forty one thousand dollars a year you can't afford a home well yes and no depending on the loan type depending on all these factors maybe forty one thousand is not possible but 50 is definitely possible right based on the numbers i did on it and then in the article it implied you really had to get to over 60 
to afford the starter home, which in Houston can be, I say, that 180 to 220 range as a resale home. You would be yeah. more of a... No, yeah, if you're watching this right now and you're like, I don't think I can afford a home at 180 to $220,000 at $40,000 a year, I can tell you right now, when I bought my house just almost two years ago, my new interest rates were a little bit lower than they are now. As of today, they're five and a half, right? Yeah, we're in the five, still low sixes. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank God for small favors. Um, when I bought my house with my wife in 21, we bought at 199, and because of some weird things with uh, real estate income, and they had to use two years of taxes, my average income was like $3,800 a month. Quick, what's the math? Let's say it's, it's like 40 grand. All up, it's under 50,000, so okay. that proves our point. So our point right there. I want to give you that encouragement because that's definitely the case. If you, um, there's, there's opportunities available and you don't have to live in parts of town you don't want to live in just to pay less. You can find starter homes at 200 or less. You can find them in the suburbs if you want, or you can go out even farther and find them in certain areas. The affordability doesn't stop when you're like rural coming into Houston. Because a lot of people think they're like, I can move out to the country so I can afford this house. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's absolutely the narrative. The narrative is you can't afford a house and you can't you can't come move to Houston and immediately buy a house. And that's just the exact opposite. Well, and I think too, when you see an article like that, the title was actually something like the average income of somebody in Houston can now no longer afford a home. So they're really putting that on you to make you feel like, well, I guess that's just the decision. And that's right. not true. Talk to an individual, talk to a lender, you know, can you pay off some debts? Um, could your family co-sign, right? Could you get a larger down payment? Like if you want to be a homeowner, find a way to become a homeowner, don't right. fall for it. And we want to kind of break all that down. In fact, I wanted to do, uh, the Houston Chronicle did a great article comparing renting versus uh, buying in Houston, okay? But like with anything, you have to really address what the numbers are when they're giving a narrative, right? right. So this was one of the statements that was said. <clears throat> Typical homeowners in Houston who bought a median home in 2022 are expected to pay about $20,000 in annual housing costs, taxes, insurance, maintenance fees, whatever. However they calculate it, they don't break it down here. Meanwhile, a renter leasing an average apartment, apartment, so first was a home, compared to an apartment, it's already apples oranges, was expected to pay about $14,000 in rent, renters, insurance, other fees, maintenance, whatever. Okay, so right away, some of the narrative was there, it's cheaper to rent than to buy. Right. But that wasn't apples to apples. Here's the next part. When they compared somebody renting a single family home and buying a single family home, the monthly housing payment was identical. Right. It was twenty two sixty three if you rented, twenty two fifty if you owned the home. So technically, even cheaper. Right. So how many people would decide to live in an apartment of four hundred square feet, five hundred square feet? I don't, I don't know what the numbers are compared to a home that has twelve hundred or fourteen hundred square feet. So right away, when you see the thing, oh man, it's cheaper to rent than to buy. But is it? And it's not, right? That's not even taking into consideration appreciation and brands going to nerd. Yeah, I was, on this. I was like, you already have my wheels turning. I mean, when we're talking about long term play, because when you buy a house, you should be looking at the long term benefits. Um, even if, like, you know, I had this conversation with an investor of mine. Yep. Um, you know, he's looking to potentially just break even on his first year of payments with a renter. And I said, the long term play is the equity. And so, before we get into that, I want to highlight something in here. There are a few things that when you are looking into, should I stay in this apartment? Should I stay at this house? How big is that? How much maintenance are you calling and having them do? How, how often does your landlord come and do the maintenance on your house, right? Um, it's not yours. You know, if you paint the walls, you got to paint them back. What's your quality of life in the place you're in now? Do you like climbing four flights of stairs to be in that cute little apartment that, you know, they stage it with furniture when you walked in and now it looks way different and you're actually miserable. And I'm not saying that owning a home is for everyone. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But a lot of people who go from apartment to house and home ownership, they talk about the quality of life that they have in the smaller space that maybe have dogs or any type of animals. 
those are the things that really can affect your decision to go to that next house or that next place. And when we're talking about renting, I mean, it's it's all bets are off. If you're going to pay someone else's mortgage and, you know, you're spending, I, I think when I was renting before we bought our house, we were paying $1,400 a month. Now, mind you, that was pretty good. Um, it was in a good part of town in Katy. Um, I, I'm telling you, like, that's... That rent now is seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars, and those rents are going to continue to go up, right? Right. Because one, everything is going to continue to go up, and you don't have control over that, right? Let's be honest. On your mortgage payment, the principal and interest, if it's a fixed rate, that's fixed. You have control of that. Yep. Taxes, you can challenge each year, right, to help keep the value down and hope for the best. Yeah. I know you're going to roll your eyes at me, but you know what I mean? Like, so that's an No, I'm not, I, I think it's a great strategy. I just, I, yeah, absolutely. You're right. The, the thing about it is that it's always the long-term play with buying a house. And sometimes it's immediate equity. We bought our house. Our mortgage payment is $1,600 a month. I'm looking at everyone around me who is buying houses now, and, and it's definitely higher, and the homes have gotten more expensive. And, and if I had bought today as compared to two years ago, I'd be buying at two sixty dollars instead of one ninety nine. I have sixty grand of equity built into my house. I could actually, we were talking about this earlier, I could take out a home equity line of credit if I had a family emergency or I needed some help and, right, because 20%? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 right, absolutely. So that's a great thing. So wait, you went from, let's say 200 sure. to 260. In less than two years. Which is crazy. And you've got to look at that, that's a return on investment. If you had invested, mind you, that's a return on whatever you put down as your down payment, which was very little. Disclaimer, this is not financial advice, or is it? Yeah, this is not, right? Stay tuned. Yeah, we're not CPAs either, by the way, or financial advisors. Um, <laughs> but but that's a huge thing right there. Now, those were two great years, but even if it's a 4%, 5% return. Which is the normal in Texas, we should disclose that. Like, 3 to 5% is natural appreciation in the state of Texas. And that's a strong return on any investment sure. that you're living in. You don't you're get that in the bank money. when you're leaving them your money every month. It, exactly. And so I think, you know, a lot of things we're hitting on is like the age old comments on why you should own a home. I think now more than ever, it's making sure that when you're reading and looking at stuff on YouTube and wherever, is it scare tactics or is it real advice? Nobody who ever bought a home has said, man, this was the dumbest thing I ever did. Four years later, when it has X amount of equity and they pay you. <laughs> when they're wiping money. their tears with their money, like that they made on the equity. No, I, but it's something that I think we can transition to in this way of thinking is sure, it's a quality of life thing, like I was saying, and, and you know, it's always the you're paying your land, your landlord instead of your lender and things like that. But I think we're at a point where, and I want to preface this, I grew up dirt freaking poor, like for the most part. Like my dad took care of me when he could, but like my parents split, my mom and I were on welfare. I didn't have a dream of home ownership at 11 to 13 years old when my life was in shambles. I didn't have that type of, you know, dream and waking up and being like, I'm going to be a homeowner one day. It wasn't until really until I got into the real estate industry that I realized that it was more achievable just because I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't know. My dad had bought his first house and, you know, in, the, in his age of 40 something. Right. So what I want to tell you here is that home ownership is achievable. It's going to take work. But it is one of the best decisions you can make for yourself. I don't care if it's a condo or a townhouse or you're buying a duplex and renting out the other side or whatever. There's so many avenues you can go, but you need to go own real estate. Um, and I kind of want to talk about this with you because I think you and I have this discussion way too much, but I think it's so pertinent. A lot of people on the internet just dunk on rich or wealthy people. And I, I've adjusted this theory in the past couple of years. I used to be like, yeah, eat the rich, like screw rich people. And then I started to get real estate and invest in things that have furthered my future and made me a little bit wealthier, you could say. I don't want you to eat the rich. I don't want you to beat the rich. I want you to outwealth the rich. And the only way you do that is through real estate. Would you agree with that? Oh, 100%. I mean, that's <clears throat> my largest investment is in real estate in general across the board. And you're right. And I think, you know, it's some of that narrative comes from people who don't think they'll ever accomplish it. And so they tell themselves a story. Yes. Oh, landlords are bad people. 
Well, they own an investment that they're getting a return on by renting out to somebody who can't buy a home. So here's an easy one. Go buy a home and then you don't have to worry about it, right? And these decisions you're making are to put yourself in a better spot financially. Right. Like one of the comments, they interviewed somebody for that same Houston article and it was like the lady uh, said she's always rented and she's going into retirement. And she's like, because I'd never have to change a light bulb myself. That's a horrible explanation <laughs> what? For, for going into it. Because if you're furious- Hold on, hold on, who changes her light bulbs? Uh, maybe the landlord in the apartment complex. Oh but my God. that goes into, if you're going into a reason not to do it, you're already setting yourself up. Yeah, stuff will come up. But the numbers always outweigh it over time. I'm gonna give you a quick story here of, we have a client and they're actually, uh, they're actually working with you on getting another home. Um, I won't say their name, but they are such an inspirational story to me because they were one of our, our first team transactions when we and I started our team and they bought a house and we didn't know it at the time, but they bought it for mom and dad. She's, she's paying the mortgage. She's renting out the house to mom and dad, multi-generational family. If that doesn't make you believe in the right to own a home, like she went out of her way, used her FHA loan to go buy a house for mom and dad. So mom and dad could accomplish something greater, right? They, they, she did that for them. That's huge. So the dream of home ownership isn't just a dream for you to go be uber wealthy. The dream is because the American dream is still alive. It's changed a lot in the past 80 to 90 years. But the principles are still the same. Absolutely. For me, it's just financial security. Like for me, I would, owning a home saves the chance of a landlord coming and saying, hey, I'm selling it tomorrow, yeah. uprooting my family, maybe a different school district, maybe yeah. into a crappier house, right? That terrifies me, right? And knowing that I'm making a move that financially is going to look really smart yep. in X amount of years. May not be overly smart the first year or maybe after have to replace the AC unit or any excuse I can come up with. The truth of the matter is the long game, I'm going to look back and be like, man, I'm really glad I made that move. Yeah. And I think that's hard for people. And don't beat yourself up. If it's if you're 25 and you feel like you're not going to be able to do it, figure out a plan. If you're 35 and you don't feel like you're going to be able to do it, come up with a plan. Like, I don't think there's a, hey, if I don't own a home by X, I'm a failure. No. I think any yeah. time. I think we've done ones where they were 60 or older or something. And they bought their first home. Man, I was like, man, that's a huge accomplishment. Their life has still changed. Well, and something of note, and Gary Vee says it best. He says that if you're in your 20s and you don't have it figured out yet, chill out. You have time. And I want you to look at that in home ownership. Like, I love my dad. My dad is awesome. He's one of my heroes. And he didn't buy a house until his 40s. Didn't have his life together until he was in his 40s. Shout out to my stepmom. You're the real MVP. But... That's the truth. Like you're not going to have it all together right away. So if you can't buy a house at the age of 22, like some people do, that's, I mean, I didn't buy a house. So I was 28. Right. And that was just because like my wife helped me get my life together. So, but that beats the hell out of 38 or 48. Right. But still there's always a good, it's always a good time. The best time to buy real estate was yesterday. Right. Or today. What, what are they, I don't do like edit this out. Cause I don't know what they're saying, but the well, kids these days are saying, well, <laughs> Yeah, no, 100%. And sorry, I want to bring back a couple other factors that come into this that kind of hit the point home. Based on U-Haul's report of oh, man, one I'm way... I'm on my phone for this one. Keep uh, I geeked out on this report. Of one-way trips going from one state to another, what was the number one state that people moved to? Texas. Texas. Man, and I'm going to give you the 10 hottest communities. Wait, wait, hang on. Let me oh, first, okay, do it. Sorry, sorry. And in the top three cities in Texas that people move to from another area, one way, Missouri City and Conroe, one in three. Both of them are suburbs of Houston. Take it away, Brandon. Okay, so it's funny you mentioned Missouri City because uh, Stafford's on this list, which is right next to Missouri City. Yep. Super okay. and, and an extremely affordable city. Quarter four, 22. These are, these, and I'm going to go through this list. All of these are dumb affordable. Like you can go buy like a 1,700 square foot house in some of these areas for like and like brand new construction, yep. okay? Maybe even less. Porter's on there, oh, sorry. That's okay, Magnolia, 1488 West, which is a huge growing suburb. If you've ever been to the Renaissance Festival in, in Magnolia, it's that, that whole area or Plannersville is where it's at. 
Magnolia's right before the Renaissance Festival. Uh, Porter, New Caney, huge, growing. It's uh, northeast of the airport and uh, one of the airports of the, the IAH, which is Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, Stafford, which is right near Missouri City, Sugarland. Right and off of 59. I mean, in that area is growing. Um, you have one of the largest Chevy dealerships down here where I used to work. Classic Chevy Sugarland. Shout out. Shout out. Hashtag it. Uh, Katie, Old Town Katie. Old Town Katie is still affordable. Now, I was going to say, go ahead. There's man. a caveat to that. Katie is the third fastest moving city in the country. So you need to be aware of that. Like, it's more competitive in Katie than it is in other sides of town. Correct. And old Katie. Holy cow, there are people that will buy and live and die in that area that they're such a fan of Old Katie. And yep. Old Katie's going through some improvements, the downtown area is yep. improving. I mean, so there's spots of even Katie that, yes, right now those are hot and or affordable to a point. A lot of these areas are going to become more and more popular. Absolutely. I mean, we just closed a home yesterday in Sunterra with, uh, with a client of ours. Um, and he's investing in there and they're, they're building a lagoon. I mean, it, it's crazy, and that's in Katy, Porter, New Caney. Now we're talking about hot communities, but all of these are still affordable. And these are north; those two are north of Houston. So Just Porter, to give you guys a, the people at home watching. There's this. like there's like Porter, New Caney East, which is there's a bunch of new builds and stuff. And then Porter, New Caney West is kind of like borders along the 99 um, area. So there's two different. This is according to HAR, which is Houston Association of Realtors. These are uh, hot neighborhoods. I didn't even know New Caney <clears throat> had two ports. That's how big they're getting. Uh, Tomball, Southwest. Oh my gosh, y'all. Tomball, like we we can literally get to Tomball from where we live, just on the go on the back roads. Tomball has grown so much. I went to Lone Star Tomball in 2010 to like 2013. And it is there used to not be a, a toll road that goes through. There used to be, it used to be one lane, like, or like two lanes or whatever. I mean, it was crazy. Okay, Conroe. Let's talk about Conroe real quick. Conroe is hotter than a mint griddle on a Saturday morning. Oh, man. I am telling you, it they is, got they got room for days to build out there because because they have so much land out there. If you go yep. east, like we don't go to cut and shoot, we don't talk about cut and shoot. But like before cut and shoot, there, there's a whole loop that goes around Congress. So like Houston has this big loop, and if you're if you're just listening to this, you can't see the hands that I'm making. But like Houston has the Beltway 610. We have like multiple loops. We have 99 that goes all the way around. When you get to Conroe, they have a similar structure. There's a lot of called uh, 336. 336, yes. 336. Look it up on a map. 336. Reading Rainbow, the more you know. Um, Conroe is incredible. They have, uh, they just put a new uh, American French warehouse out there. It's right near all the Woodlands hospitals. Like, literally, as soon as you pass all the hospitals in the Woodlands, you literally are in Conroe. Um, so much new development out there. You're near the Woodlands, so you're near a lot of oil and gas sector. You're near um, restaurants and huh. bars and that area. Oh my gosh. The, mall, By the, the Cynthia Woods Pavilion. Yep. Like, my God, the Woodlands is nice. And so you're in Conroe right there, but you're also next to Lake, Lake Conroe. I love skiing out there. It's great. It's awesome. Um, so Conroe is Conroe's a huge part. Huntsville. Huntsville's growing because it's a college town. A lot of people, oh yeah, like that's where Sam Houston State University is. But also, like, People want to live near the college and they don't want to live on campus. We literally had someone last year. They invested in a house for their kids to live nearby, but they weren't on the campus. And it was great. It was perfect. It worked out and they bought it cheap, like $230 or something like that. There's also a prison there too, I think. So it could be either one. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't put Richmond on this list. Well, I think they're closing that prison down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Angleton. Okay, look. I don't drive to Angleton. We don't talk about Angleton, but it's on this list. <laughs> like, my VA is going to put like a... Like a graphic of Angleton, just like an X in it. <laughs> I the the drive from my house to Angleton is almost two hours. I just I, I don't drive. Now. Yeah, but it's, but it's hot. Simleton. I mean, there's areas that are further away. I mean, the thing that's great about Houston, think about if you work remote. Yeah. Some of these things are not a topic. If you're near an H E B, or specifically if you're my wife and we're near a Target at a <laughs> hospital, then you're good. It doesn't really matter what the name of, what the name of the city is, right? And that's the thing about Houston. There's literally an H E B, a Target, a Walmart. A hospital it's in every one of these towns so easily accessible that for some of them they start to look the same with all the amenities that you're going to automatically have there's definitely a local mexican restaurant in every single town and so welcome to tex-mex uh capital of the world yep. um well and then the last one's tomball so tomball is kind of built like that 
they have Tejas Barbecue, which is like a local joint that's super great. They have Tejas Burgers that they expanded. There's uh, microbreweries out there. I mean, there are so many things in Tomball. They have a Tomball German Festival every year. Even if you go to Katie, Katie has the Rice Festival every year, and they have so many different things going on. Uh, Brandon's hungry. Oh, dude. I, I, you can tell. We got off the list of the cities, and now we're just talking about wrestling. We're just talking about wrestling. <laughs> um, Tomball's a train town. Katie's a train town. I mean, you have so many things, historical things. You go to Rosenberg, there's a train museum, which is Rosenberg is kind of uh, kind of near Richmond, Stafford, Sugarland area. And also ridiculously affordable. Yeah. So you have so many opportunities as a future homeowner to pick where you want to live. You're not going to be put in an area of town that you don't want to live in just because of price. Like you can go find. I mean, there's ten areas that are hot that are affordable. I would only I, I will only say this: the average price point in Katy is probably higher than all of these other areas. I think that yeah. there should just be a disclaimer there that Katy is expensive because everybody wants to move there. Um, but if you go, I mean, we have clients that just closed in Magnolia, two twenty-five, two thirty, I think. That's crazy. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's great out there. So, um, so back to back to the point of affordability. One of the things you have to do is go talk to someone that gives you the right answers. That gives you you got to go find out what can I afford. What is my what is my purchase power? Um, there's a reason why on our website at sellingwithsniders.com, there's a part for mortgages. And it says, we need we want you to talk to a mortgage professional so you can find out your buying power. We want to empower you. I don't, you know, hey, what do you pre-approve for? Or, hey, do you know how much your buying power is? Those are two completely different questions. And it's empowering the, the average consumer, the average buyer, to go out and make a decision that affects generations. 100%. And I'm going to add with two things there. Number one is don't allow somebody else slash specifically the new social media and this type of article to tell you if you can afford a home. That's number one. Okay. Number two, do whatever it takes. I have a client right now. We have gone and looked at every scenario. We're going to have a relative cosign on the loan. This guy was so adamant that he was going to own a home that it probably took us 30 days to walk through different scenarios to find one. We're under contract right now, and he's going to close. And I swear, if I remember correctly, I think the sales price was two hundred five, dollars and the seller's paying like $6,000 in closing costs. Mm. So not only is he in a, in a competitive price point, um, he's in one where they, in theory, went on paper, say you can't afford or it's not going to get approved or whatever. And this guy kept at it. And it's something beautiful because he's married. He has kids. This is changing their dynamic financially. He doesn't do that. There's a chance, sadly, that they may rent forever. Well, it's changing their future. I mean, you got to think about it. Like a lot of people, uh, accumulate their wealth through real estate and they leave it to their kids. Yep. Um, we have a client right now, he's selling some of his investment properties to go buy more properties, but he inherited it from his dad. Um, I want to put a disclaimer out here that if you are listening and you're not from the state of Texas, understand, or you're not in Austin, DFW, or, or maybe maybe you are in those areas, um, you should understand that prices vary across the country. Uh, it's actually a heck of a lot cheaper to live in the Midwest than it is in most places. Um, if you go to California... Good luck and Godspeed because I will never pay a million dollars for a house uh, in California. This is me. But there are places where it's gonna it's not as affordable. When we're talking about Houston, I mean Houston has to be one of the most affordable cities around. And you know, when we get to like the Midwest, like you know, we have investors that invest in the Midwest and they talk about like you know buying like a fourplex for 150 grand. I'm like, I can you show me some of these properties? Like, but in terms of Houston, absolutely love it here. Um, I want to give you a, a quick thing. So I don't know about you, Dave, but I like to know what's going on, events and things like that. And we just started doing something recently. This is a shameless self plug, by the way. We just, started, we just started doing something recently on our website. You can actually look at events this weekend. So Houston has such a cultural mecca. I mean, if you go to Bel Air, the street signs are in different languages respecting Ooh. different cultures. If you go to Katy, they have Katy Asian Town, and there's so many things there. Tiger would just put a pop stroke there. Um, we have a, a vibrant uh, Middle Eastern and Indian community in Sugarland. That I mean, some of the best food I've ever eaten has been in Houston. I know we keep talking about food, but 
Um, if you want to know what's going on, you can always go on our website. There's always events going on. But this city celebrates its cultures. And so we're not just talking about affordability. We're talking about quality of life. We're talking about enhancing the things that you get to do as a result of, hey, I, I only bought a $200,000 house instead of a three hundred. dollars um, just because I found the, the right house and now I can go enjoy these things. You know, when Hamilton comes into town, I want to be able to go see it at the hobby center or whatever. Another uh, shameless plug. Anyway, um, Dave will never take me to see Hamilton, so I don't even know why we keep doing podcast episodes. It took my wife, though. Um, no, that those are all great points. I think, honestly, the name of this podcast is going to be probably Houston, the Affordable City. I think it's also could be called Brandon and Dave beating this topic to death. Because I think we're so adamant that it is, and it drives me nuts when we see articles and videos and people say otherwise. Yeah. Because those people are saying it for a reason. It's clickbait or it's to grab attention or it's a, oh my God, this is a horrible thing, so you're going to read it. But you and I are on the ground level. I mean, I just told a story about a guy, right? Like we're seeing that monthly closing deals where people who don't fit this mold financially or buying homes, yep. or people who didn't give up. And so that's why we're passionate about it, why it sounds like we're saying the same things you've been hearing for 40 years, because it's true. Yeah, 100%. Right? Well, we're gonna bring this home. If you are watching this or listening to this, or maybe you're just scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and you hear something that catches your eye, oh wow, that didn't even sound right, catches your brain, I don't know, your no, receptacles. Neither one of us are catching it with eyes <laughs> at this point. Like, I need a buffer. Uh, <laughs> Um, so if that's something, if, if something is clicking for you and you're like, Hey, like I, I want to achieve this dream of home ownership, uh, Dave, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, I'm Dave at Dave, your mortgage guy.com is my email. You can find me YouTube, Dave, your mortgage guy, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, pretty much anywhere you look. Dave, do you have a TikTok guy. yet? I do have a TikTok. Oh man. Oh wow. I'm not doing any dances. I'm hoping it's banned so I don't have to deal with TikTok. Jesus. Any longer. Um, <laughs> And again, you can find us uh, at Selling with the Snyder Group across all platforms or sellingwiththesnyders.com. Uh, I should start doing that. I think it would gain more traction. But uh, if you're looking to, whether it's your first home or you're just looking to maybe invest in the city of Houston, um, you know, as a short-term rental, long-term rental, anything like that, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to talk to you and help you achieve that ownership.